My name is Mark Michaelis, and today I'm going to do a talk uh, about exponential technology. Uh, I, at heart, am a nerd, uh, and if you're looking to get nerdy stuff like code and how to write um, high-performance uh, C-sharp, this is not the right, uh, not the right session for you. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of higher level business stuff, about a bunch of exponential technologies and what the effect is on us. So just to be aware, this is one of the, the times I'm not going to be opening up the IDE. I want to start with a look at um, a device called an imaging machine or a circuit imaging machine. In 2016, I started a new company. And the, what we had done is I'd combined, uh, partnered with a scientist and we'd figured out how to print circuit boards 10 times faster than anything on the market. And what we did was we sort of put 1,000 lasers together, and we, we imaged the circuit boards with a laser. And we'd figured out a way to do this at about 15 microns, 15 to 50 microns per line. So the lines that you're actually doing for the circuit were about 15 to, to 50 microns. Uh, and we had about 1,000 lasers to go image these boards. And we were trying to increase the speed with which you could produce a circuit board by, um, by 10 to 100 times. And it, it, the, the speed depended on how many lasers we put in the machine. Uh, and you know, it, was, it, was, it was pretty high tech, uh, what we were doing. And the reason why it made sense for us to do this is we were changing the market by tenfold. And it turned out about 85% of the market is, is uh, uh, circuit boards are printed in Asia, as you can imagine. And so most of our market we were selling, in this case, from the US. Uh, into Asia, and 85% of what we were producing was, was going to be sold in Asia. Each machine cost about a million dollars. Well, this is great, but unfortunately, the scientist had a better idea. The scientist figured out that he could use a technology to go do 3D metal printing. So we had an idea that was exponentially better than anything on the market at the time. We were using computer vision to go ahead and orient the circuit boards and make sure that we could image one side of the circuit board compared to the other side with about a 10 micron accuracy. We were going ahead and analyzing the circuit using computer vision to figure out where to place the board and make sure that they were done correctly. It was pretty high tech stuff. And the scientist said, no, nah, 10 is not good enough. 10% increase or 10 uh, times fold, 10 fold increase uh, is not good enough. We need to go to 3D printing, because that's a 100 times fold increase. Uh, and so he decided that 3D printing was a better investment than, than circuit imaging, and I, I think he's right. And two years later, he now has a 3D metal printer. This is actually a, a, a pictures of the actual 3D metal printer he has. I just sold three of those, and it's about two years later that he came out with this. Uh, and so he can actually go print 3D metal. I'm not sure what you know about 3D metal printing, but it turns out in order to do 3D metal printing, there's three steps. You first of all actually have to go print the material to go print a sort of 3D image. And then there's a, a sort of a plastic that's a, that formulates the, the, the structure of the image to make sure it doesn't fall out of place and sort of stays in the right shape. And, that's, and then to, get, to remove the plastic, you have to do what's called debinding, to remove the plastic from the, from the substrate. And then lastly, you go put it in a kiln and you sort of heat it up. Um, really hot and make sure that the whole thing sticks together. And what was unique about the idea that, uh, that Dan had for his 3D metal printing is he'd skipped the second step entirely. He no longer had to do debinding because he had figured out that if you use water for binding, you could actually skip that entire, entire step and there was no need to go ahead and get rid of the plastic that was, that was forming the mold. And that was his idea that was tenfold better than my idea. And it turns out that the reason why, although it seemed like the market we had with circuit imaging was amazing, it's not like circuits are going to disappear anytime soon. Seems like it's a pretty important thing to have in the market. It turns out that circuit, Im circuit imaging and imaging of circuit boards is not in itself going to be an exponential technology. We'll continue to grow and circuits will continue to be produced. But they, the actual circuits themselves are not an exponential technology. Whereas 3D metal printing, or actually 3D printing in general, is an exponential technology, meaning we will see a tenfold or more increase within sort of every two years for as long as we can see, as long as we can forecast technology. To give you an example of another exponential technology, this one you all know well, in about 1436, um, 
the printing press was invented, and within 50 years, they'd printed 8 million books. And it turns out, within those 50 years, they printed as many books that had ever been created in the 1,000 years before that. That's an exponential technology. Suddenly, in this short window, we accelerate the ability to produce something in, in, in unfathomable uh, numbers. The way to put this is to think that there are decades where nothing happens, and there are weeks where decades happen. And it turns out we are currently in one of those weeks. We're in one of those weeks where technology is changing, and there's so many exponential technologies that are coming together at the same time that we're to the point where we're going to see exponential technologies, and the world is going to be changed in a very, very rapid amount of time. There's uh, three things I want to sort of get you to grasp in this talk. One is to begin reflecting on the future rather than where you are today. So many of us, especially as developers, are spending our time worried about how should we write this statement, or what is the best program to write, or which technology should we choose for this particular program. And we're focused on the here and now. And we're doing that at a very fast pace, and we're totally heads down focused on what we're doing. But we're not stepping back and beginning to think about other technologies that are around us. And how do we need to use those technologies to transform what we're doing today so it's not linear, but it's exponential? We need to realize that in many cases, we're at inflection point. We can't tell exactly that this is an exponential technology, or most people can't tell, because the beginning of an exponential technology looks linear. And we're now at an inflection point that we need to sort of take advantage of many exponential technologies coming out. And lastly, what do we do with that? Knowing that or recognizing that inflection point, what do we do that and how do we need to start thinking differently? Um, I'm not going to do a survey, but I'm just sort of ask some questions. What do you think are the exponential technologies that are out there today? This is not a trick question. Nanotechnologies. nanotechnologies, excellent. So one of the exponential technologies that's definitely there is nanotechnologies. And I'd say in particular, nanotechnologies is something that has not yet hit the inflection point. We're right, about, we're right around there, so we're waiting for that to happen. But when it hits, it's going to be exponential, absolutely. What else? I didn't hear. Can you repeat? Still didn't hear you. Can somebody? Yeah, gen genetics, absolutely. Genomes. Uh, there is no doubt. We can already see that genetics is something that's starting to uh, be an exponential technology. With prices dropping from sort of $1,000 down to $100, you can now go ahead and submit your, for your genome to go, you're not, not entirely sequenced, uh, but you can go submit genetics now and get that. Uh, a subset of it sequenced it for about $100. That's staggering. 10 years ago, it was $10,000 to do the same thing. And about a few years before that, um, it was $100,000 just to sequence the first one. So absolutely, genetics or epigenetics is an uh, exponential technology. Others? Quantum computing, exactly. Google just announced recently the fact that quantum computing, they've actually got some quantum computing progress that they've made. Um, and there's, there's huge opportunity in quantum computing. But we still haven't hit the inflection point. Uh, there's still some significant challenges for being able to uh, wrangle that down and actually take advantage of, of uh, quantum computing. Other things? Repeat, please. Machine learning, yes. Machine learning, absolutely. Machine learning AI um, are uh, incredibly, um, have some incredible potential to become, uh, to be exponential technologies. It's interesting, many of us in the technology field think today that machine learning has started to, to hit the, the crux of, of what's possible. Uh, but we're still using algorithmic approaches to machine learning. Uh, we're still dependent on huge amounts of data. And the cost, the CPU cost for doing things like AI is still extremely high compared to what you can go ahead and discover and figure out. Um, and so we expect for sure, as technologists, we expect for sure that AI and machine learning will be exponential technologies that will take off in the very near future. And for those of us in the computing field, we're trying to take advantage of that right now. What can we do to, to be ready for AI and machine learning immediately? What else? 
A brain-computer interface, sure. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put that sort of more generic, generically uh, in terms of the, the progress that we're seeing in, uh, in the medical field. Uh, that's certainly a, a challenging field. What can we do to sort of interface with the brain and start to talk to that? Um, my research on, on this specifically is that we're not, we're not quite there yet. It's still got a ways to go. Uh, and it, one of the reasons for that that's interesting is that it's more around human uh, behavior and what people are willing to have happen rather than what's ca uh, technically capable uh, with the technology. And there's a number of items like this. So another one that I think is exponential is autonomous driving, uh, where we are sort of at the mercy of the legal industry rather than at the mercy of the technology industry. And uh, just the same as, as uh, a, brain, a brain interface, brain computer interface, we'll see that there's several cases where sort of uh, our morals or our legal system is actually preventing us from making the progress that we would expect to be able to make uh, in, in that field. Here's, here's a list that, that I've put together and sort of gathered over time of some, some things that, I, that I, uh, I believe are exponential technologies. Uh, and the point is not that you look at each one of these individually, but to realize that there's so many at the same time that are converging uh, that really begins to make us think differently. And many of us, as I mentioned, have been focused specifically on one or, or two particular industries, the industry that we happen to be having a job, uh, and we're not stepping back and sort of thinking, oh my goodness, if there's so many exponential technologies uh, that are converging at the same time, what are the implications for me personally, for the company that I work for, and obviously for society, society at large? Uh, this is a staggering list when you consider these are not linearly increasing technologies, but exponentially increasing technologies. Uh, another one that's fairly obvious that we've now uh, significantly sort of passed um, the inflection point is digital, digital photography. Um, we saw a very stagnant growth in digital photography, and now if we sort of go ahead and measure um, the, the number of photos that are being produced, uh, it's become staggering. And you can look at this at a global level. You can even look at this at a personal level. The number of photographs that you're taking, the number of photographs that are in your, uh, on your phones, um, the number of photographs that you're storing, uh, our problem today is not uh, how many or where to store them, but how to sort them and then be able to organize them and access the data that's within those, within those photographs. Uh, but, but we look at this graph and go, oh, it's just exponential. But when we start to sort of fathom the numbers, um, it becomes staggering. You know, I can literally walk to the back of the room and make sort of you know, 40 or so steps. But if I start to do that exponentially, I am go to the moon and back within the same number. Uh, that's a staggering difference when you start to think about exponential technologies. Um, somebody mentioned ec uh, epigenetics, so I won't spend much time there, but another area that we've talked about is sort of the difference between incandescents and LEDs. Um, this is a technology uh, that we just begin to take for granted uh, as quickly as the fact that it's only been about 10 years that this has started to happen. And now almost rarely, we've got laws in many countries that say, no, you cannot have an incandescent bulb. You cannot buy one. You have to go with a, an LED-based technology. Uh, and that's happened sort of within 10 years. Uh, one, one I didn't hear you mention is robotics. Uh, that, that's actually quite interesting because it is start to get in this, this, this world of, hey, are we more human or are are humans becoming more robotic, or robot, robots becoming more human? And we see this in two, two different ways. First of all, if you'd asked me uh, 15 years ago, hey, will you be able to get rid of management? I sort of looked at you and go, management? No, management's a people skill. There's no way that we can replace managers. That, that's a very important. It's not going to be, become autonomous. We're not going to be able to automate managers. And it turns out there's this little company with a four-letter word called Uber. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Um, anyway, it turns out Uber is managing hundreds of thousands of workers entirely by computer. There are no managers. And not only that, they're not even employees. So they're, they're completely at free to do what they want and, and, and behave however they want. And still, we have no managers. Um, and if you'd asked us, as I say, 15 years ago, hey, can we go and replace the management level? Uh, it would never, never occur to us. Uh, and so we're starting to begin to move into a world where we're doing things that we didn't believe we could do. Uh, and now, I, I don't believe that, that we're saying that the computer is thinking in the same way a manager does. It doesn't sort of uh, care about the workers as we'd like to think. But it turns out it is able to motivate. And it is able to change behavior. 
uh, in just the same way that a manager does, and perhaps even more effectively. Um, another way to think about this is a robot's becoming more, more human. Uh, if I came to you sort of five, five years ago and said, what do you think about having a computer? Do you think a computer would be better at choosing a, part, a life partner for you, uh, than you than you would? We would object strongly. That's ridiculous. Ch my choice of a life partner is clearly your intuition. There's a ton of personal preference. There's no way we're ever going to get a computer to be able to make that choice better. But it turns out we're giving tons of data to the point that now one third of life partners are being chosen by computers in dating applications and the like. Now that's either scary or that's profound. Um, we'll get to the point where the data that we're exposing allows the computer to decide better than us about which clothes we should wear for the particular date that we're going to be going on. Because it turns out the computer knows what the preferences are of the partner that we're just about to go date. And we can start to manipulate. I'm not saying this is something to be proud of. We can start to manipulate our behavior in order to manipulate the uh, partner's behavior in terms of making them think one thing or the other about us. Because all of the data is available in a way that a human can't comprehend. Can't comprehend. Questions? So the question was, what would happen if everybody followed the, the same, the same uh, algorithm? It, it, it turns out we can all follow the same algorithm as long as the data feeding the algorithm is different. Yeah. yeah, so let me be clear. Is, is it possible that the same algorithm could be chosen such that everybody would drive the same streets at the same time? Of course, absolutely. And I would say that those are just bad algorithms. But if we can go ahead and look at the example of sort of, hey, well, who's my life partner or something like that, if the inputs can be different in terms of knowledge of what the life partner is like, and therefore it would change the clothes that I wear based on that particular interaction, we now have enough data to make that possible. The, the statement is, long-term, it might converge just the same as the traffic patterns may all converge. And guess what? We'll change the algorithm. I actually tried myself to, I, I thought I could do better than the algorithm, because as I drove into town last night, everybody said, all the, the uh, Google said, take the expressway. And I looked at the expressway, and, or I guess expressway is not the right word in this context. It wasn't very fast at all. Um, and, and everybody said, take the expressway. And, and I was like, no, I'm going to take the side streets. And I did actually do some exploration on some side streets, and my time dropped significantly as soon as I got off the expressway. It said, oh, we're going this way. It's going to be way slower. You're now going to, it's going to cost you another five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever the number was. Um, there's, there's a movement these days to argue that we're entering the fourth industrial revolution. This started at the um, World Economic Forum uh, in, in, in uh, Sweden, Switzerland, excuse me. And the argument was, we are now have so many exponential technologies converging at the same time that this is going to be a different industrial revolution than the industrial revolution that started in the 1970s. I'm not going to argue whether that is correct or incorrect. But I do think it should give us time to pause. The speed with which industrial revolutions are happening is increasing exponentially, such that we can start to not measure, oh, this, this industrial revolution is going to take, you know, another next 100 years we'll experience another one. But if we are now entering another industrial revolution, only you know, 20 years since the, the last one, or 30 years since the last one, that's a pretty scaring pace that we need to start thinking about. One reason to think about the fact that we may be entering another industrial revolution is the velocity with which technologies are coming out. There's nothing in comparison. We go through that list of exponential technologies that we have, and the fact that the, they are increasing so fast, uh, it's no longer, oh, let's go examine sort of the agricultural industrial revolution. There was one thing that was changing. There was one thing that was happening. It was all happening around agriculture. We look at the Industrial Revolution with sort of the machine age. 
And again, we were changing what, what was happening in factories. And it was changing society in the sense that everybody was now moving towards the city. But it was really one thing. It was automation with, with machines and electricity, specifically. The other thing that's interesting about this industrial revolution, if we want to see this one, is the breadth and depth. The list of technologies I had is staggering. Not just the speed with which these technologies are coming out, but the breadth of the number of technologies that are coming out at the same time. And lastly, the impact on systems. The way that systems are actually being changed. The way that Uber can go ahead and organize an entire work for, workforce of people that are not employees, that can come and go based on demand automatically. They control their demand is controlled automatically by the actual need for for number of Ubers, uh, for number of drivers. Um, similarly, with something like like Airbnb, there's an entire impact on systems because of the technology. What's interesting about industrial revolutions and, and the name, I, I would prefer to argue that industrial revolutions are judged by, by historians, not by technologists. So I'm a little bit cautious about saying that this, in fact, is an industrial revolution just because there's lots of technology involved. Generally, the characteristic of an industrial revolution is that it changes, there's a change in labor. Labor is significantly transformed by the industrial revolution. And so now we begin to ask some diff difficult questions are, oh, well, perhaps labor is being changed significantly by the industrial revolution that we, we, we might be experiencing today. And the example of Uber and employment or Airbnb and employment are, are great examples where labor is being transformed and changed in ways that, that have, not, have not occurred in the past. Um, the other thing that's interesting is to go and say, hey, companies don't necessarily experience diminishing returns as they increase their, um, as they increase their profits. As an example, um, th these, these statistics are from June 20, uh, 2019. If you look at the net income, so this is profit per employee. Uh, this is not even the top four. There's some others too, but they're not as, as tech related. They're, much, uh, they're, they're manipulated a little bit. So of some top tech companies that we know about, we got a per-employee profit. This is not revenue, this is profit. We got a per-employee profit of $1,800,000. That is insane. And the problem, and the ish, what makes it interesting is if you go back to the previous part about industrial revolutions, the profit margin is increased without increasing the number of employees. Or to put it slightly differently, the profit margin is increasing exponentially while the number of employees needed is increasing linearly. And you can look at each of these companies and start to sort of evaluate. We have profit margins that are staggeringly off the charts per employee. And that's radically changing the labor market because we no longer need as many employees for the profit margins to go up. When you compare this, to sort of the 1970s or 1980s, the top companies at that time were all based in Detroit. They were car companies. And in order for the car companies to increase uh, profits, they added more employees so they could produce more cars. But it was a linear increase. The difference now with these digital companies, which have all come about in the last 20 years, is that their profit margins are increased without increasing employees. Um, a couple other things to note about the changes in labor is that in the past, we've seen significant, we've seen significant improvements in the quality of life um, due, to the, um, due to the industrial revolution. Uh, and I'll, I'll leave it for you to judge whether, whether that's true. Ha is life getting better because of the Industrial Revolution? One of the qualities that, that, or one of the characteristics that comes along with something like uh, machine learning and AI is there's this, this incredible need for data. You're not going to do machine learning or AI without vast quantities of data, either that are there or existing beforehand, or that the machine can go ahead and generate on the fly. 
And the question when it comes to the sort of quality of life that I imagine most of you as parents have started to wrestle with is at what age do we have the discussion, that, that life-impacting discussion with our kids? I don't mean the one about the birds and the bees. I mean the one about the data. I mean the one that says, oh yeah, it's okay for you to go ahead and turn on your GPS and allow Google to track you. It's okay for you to go take that photograph or this photograph because it's going to be with you for life. And so rather than the birds and the beads discussion, we now have to have discussions with our kids at an age as young as sort of five or six, as soon as we give them a device, whether it's an iPod, a tablet, or a phone, the first discussion is not about sex. The first discussion is about data, because that data is going to be with them for life. And it will be used by companies to manipulate them specifically, not them generally. Not the children generally, but each individual kid specifically because of the data they're generating. And no doubt, you've, you've sort of worked with your, your significant others to sort of decide, hey, at what age do we have, we have a, we decide to give our child a phone? But the more important question is at what age do we start to have this discussion about what they're going to do with the phone? Obviously, one of the impacts on labor is around the risk of jobs. And I'm not going to be sort of a forecast that said, oh my goodness, jobs are going away. I'd much prefer to look at this from a statistical or factual perspective. 50% of jobs are at the risk of automation and digitization. Does that mean that we aren't going to have enough jobs? I'm saying of the jobs today, the ones that exist today, 50% of them are at risk of automation. Could new jobs come about? Absolutely, of course. Who might predict that that wouldn't be the case? And as we look at historically, there was, there was many people who forecast, oh my goodness, machines are coming about, therefore we aren't going to have any jobs. And that wasn't the case at all. Rather, life was improved. Life became better for those people, and they moved into the cities, and they were able to focus um, on one specific uh, skill set so that others could focus on another skill set. And the end result was that production was greater and the quality of life went up. Will we have new jobs? Of course. What's interesting about, the interesting question to ask is, of those new jobs that are coming out, who are they targeting? Are they targeting high school graduates? Are they targeting college graduates? And is the impact that we're going to go see happen in the future is it going to create jobs for a certain se sector and then prevent other sectors of the population not having jobs? And what do we do to change that? Of the current jobs that are out there today, 30% of those tasks can be automated. The jobs that are there today. Um, and the key question that I think we're sort of asking is, OK, surely new jobs will emerge. But will new jobs emerge for the people whose jobs are being replaced, rather than new knowledge workers that don't exist? And clearly, and today, as it stands, there is a shortage of labor, obviously, in the knowledge industry, in the knowledge jobs. There's still a shortage of labor in things like trucking, which can be entirely automated. But what will truckers, what will, what will truckers do when their job gets replaced, because the question is, do they have the skill set to move, move into, knowledge, into the knowledge world? Um, there are three phases to the Industrial Revolution that we should be aware of. First of all, it's accessible to the elite, either those with money or those with knowledge. I expect, or I assume, or presume that most of us in the room are members of that elite either as, techno as technologists at a minimum. We know about things. How many of you can go talk to people that are not in this industry and say, hey, what does AI stand for? Or ML.net. OK, forget ML, just start with machine learning. And we start to realize that we're, we're amongst those elite, and we have the best jobs. I mean, 
I, I have my children who are teenagers come and say, what should I major in? And there's no doubt in my mind, clearly software engineering is the best. I'm in the software engineering and I still think it's a fantastic industry. Now, I don't actually believe it's the only one, but I believe, do believe it's a great, uh, a great job to have. I even go to the point of comparing it to sort of say doctors and say, hey, is software engineering better than the doctors? And the problem is that doctors are now entering a production line. They're being managed, measured by how many patients can they see in a particular time period. And it's much more about profit than it is about caring. It's much more about profit than it is about healthcare and um, uh, saving lives. Eventually, what we see in, software, in industrial revolutions is we start to see that workers rebel. And the politics going on around today, I think even more so in Europe than the United States, is, is evident of this, this uh, change begin to happen. And eventually, we get to democratization. What's interesting to note about the democratization, where everything be where it becomes available, is that we're still experiencing, there's entire continents like Africa that never got democratized. They never experienced the Industrial Revolution um, or the mechanization, mechanization era. That was entirely skipped. Going back to technology, we've seen industries dem industry demise. Undoubtedly, these industries are being transformed and changed, whether it's newspapers, music, or taxis. What's next? And the key thing to ask, of course, is where is your industry? Where do you fit? And it's not just from a perspective, oh my goodness, it's going to be transformed. That's not, you should not approach this from the perspective, oh my goodness, I need to go into a different industry. But rather, what do you need to do to reinvent your industry? Which is a completely different question. One is motivated by fear. The other is motivated by opportunity. I have a team that meets about once a week. It's called the ideation team. There's about 10 of us in the company. And what we do is get together and think of ideas. We have a running list uh, that we all have on our phones where we sort of add frustrations that are going on in our lives. Literally speaking, uh, for example, the traffic that I experienced last night was a nightmare. I just write it down. That's a frustration. Now, there's no intellectual effort required. I just write down the frustrations that I'm experiencing every day. Uh, and we keep a list of that. And then we get together on Monday afternoons around 4.30. And uh, the, the goal of that, of that time is for us to go through those frustrations and sort of say, hey, is this a frustration that we can possibly tackle? We eliminate. You know, the traffic, we've gone through that 10 times. We haven't come up with any great ideas. We're not going to eliminate traffic. Uh, we haven't got the scale or the opportunity to influence that. Um, and then, then we go through and sort of saying, oh, hey, what are some potential ideas? The whole, you can come up with any idea, no matter how wacky, of starting to tackle that problem. And so we have these discussions, and there's sort of stages and phases that we go through. So we start with the, the frustrations, we move into the ideas, then we decide whether the ideas have any validity, and then we've got a bunch of business plans that you have to go through. We essentially work through an ideation process, so that out at the end pops something like a circuit imaging uh, a machine to go ahead and print circuit boards, as an example. I challenge you in each of your industries, regardless of what your role is specifically, to start thinking about what is it going to take for you to take your particular industry and reinvent and transform that. There's a couple things to specifically look for. First of all, what are the opportunities to digitize the industry that you're in? And if the answer comes back as we can't think of anything, then go back to the drawing table and think some more. Because the value is becoming the data, not the product itself. I work a lot with utility industry, electrical, uh, both electric, gas, and water. And they are beginning to recognize themselves that, in fact, the data that they can get by your electric utilization is more valuable than the electricity that they're producing, in, in fact. It's more interesting for them to know that you just purchased an electric car 
than it is the fact that you went and purchased so much electricity uh, during that past month. They're starting to put meters that can go ahead and read your meter every five minutes across the entire populations. And the reason they're doing that is not because they want to bill you every five minutes. They couldn't care less. What's really interesting to them is they want to go ahead and see, can we determine what your behavior is? When did you buy a new washing machine? When do you run your washing machine? And how can they turn that digital data into knowledge that then becomes their primary business? The data itself is more important than electricity that they supply. What are you guys doing with your data to transform the data into revenue, to transform the data into knowledge? At some point, once you've figured out how to digitize, that allows you to go ahead and disrupt the industry to do something radically different. Um, and then, ultimately, you want to get to the point where you can start driving costs down because it's a linear increase in uh, expenses or a linear increase in uh, employment, but an exponential increase in pro profit. To the point that now, when we go buy a digital photo, and we, when we go do digital photography, we don't even pay any attention to the storage. We don't even notice. It is zero cost. The cost of taking a photo today is zero. When we start to look at exponential organizations, no longer just the technologies themselves, the exponential uh, organizations, these are the kinds of things we want to be thinking about in terms of transforming our organizations. How do we go ahead and do staffing on, de on demand in the same way that someone like Uber did? For those of us in the technology industry, if you look at your, um, your management or your company on a, as, as a whole, one of the ways you, that's being thought about or has already been happened is, how can we go ahead and move our employment offshore? How can you know, various countries go put their, get hire employees that are no longer in that country because they don't have to deal with even from the, sorry, the costs themselves may be cheaper from the individual resource perspective, but they don't even have to pay the, the employment costs that are involved when you start to go offshore. Um, another thing to think about is the, the, the ability to go ahead and interface, uh, improve the UI, um, the UI interface that you're going to go ahead and work with your tool, but most more importantly, to go ahead and provide an API over the UI. One of the areas where we see this happening in Europe way better than in the United States is in the area of banking. Turns out your regulations are far less um, restrictive in, the, in, in Europe. Uh, and you're now producing banking companies that have the ability for you to go ahead and uh, add and remove uh, money from your account or to view your account. But those on the bleeding edge in the banking industry are not just providing a UI for you to do that. They're providing an API that you can go to PowerShell and determine what your balance is. We'll go ahead and do the deduction. And the purpose of that is not that you personally can go do something in PowerShell, but that you can go automate your processes. There's now an API across your bank account for you to go do things like make transactions back and forth. What are you doing in your industry, not just to expose a phen phenomenal UI, but a phenomenal API that allows uh, businesses to integrate with what you're doing? One last comment. When I compare my life to the life of Bill Gates, sure, I'm not getting on a jet and flying wherever I want to. But from a lifestyle perspective, most of us in the software industry are fairly comfortable. And one of the things that's interesting as we start to look at, at exponential technologies is in a world where life, at least for ourselves, for those of us in the first world, is fairly comfortable, is it all about profit? And my challenge is that we start to think slightly differently, not just about money, but about quality of life.
And what do we need to do to not get more money, exponentially or not, but to improve quality of life? And they are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. It's no longer about capitalism and dehumanizing. It's about improving day-to-day -day experiences and what's most, and focusing on things that are most important. One of the interesting things that's been true in this for, for me, from personal experience, is that when my wife and I got married, we decided that, 50, that, that we would go ahead and set up a scale such that our salary at time X, we would give away, you know, I'm just going to make up numbers, 15, 15, 000, 15%. But when we reached another level, then we changed and said, oh, at this point, we're going to be giving away 25% because if I didn't need it when I was having this much, why do I suddenly need it now? And our approach was to sort of change, increase the percentage of giving to the point, and again, just making up numbers, said, okay, well, when we get to $100,000, if we didn't need so much at $50,000, maybe at $100,000, we need to give away 50%. Because we didn't need it before, why do we suddenly need it now? And I challenge you to mark your own lines. It's not important where you draw the lines. But to start to think differently that it's not all about profit and what can you do to transform and improve human life. It isn't just about having another device. In fact, the question you should be asking is, when, how long can I delay giving my device to my, to my child? How, long, how much time can I go without the device? And one of the things that comes along with all these exponential technologies, whether it's related to employment or AI, and the way we can sort of track people, or the way that, um, well, the things we can do with the technology is we have to ask the moral question. And what surprises me as I interact with large, multi-billion dollar corporations is how many ethicists they have. They don't exist. You can go get a degree in philosophy from university, and I can testify personally, you're not going to get a job with a degree in philosophy. Uh, because, we're no, because businesses are, no, are not interested in asking the moral question. They're always asking the profit question. And one of the obligations that comes with exponential technologies is to at least consider how do we improve life rather than increase capitalism? Questions? Yeah. So one of the questions, the, so the question I asked was, what's the impact on government with all these exponential technologies? Um, my, my first statement, my first answer is to say that clearly not enough, because I think governments are way behind the technologies. Uh, and my example of autonomous cars is a good example, right? The laws and governments are not keeping pace with what we can do with technology. There's no doubt that within the next five years, we can create autonomous cars that are better drivers than humans. But our tolerance of a mistake, or even of an accident, whether it was a mistake or not, of an accident, is zero. Either as humans, morally, and certainly as governments, to the point that we're not willing to change the laws. When you get into a car that is autonomous, even a little bit, the first thing you have to do is say, yes, I will not take my hands off the steering wheel. In fact, when your car drives and steers on its own, after about five seconds, it starts to shake and say, hey, wake up. You've got to be controlling me. I can't, I can't do this myself. Yeah. Yeah, so the question, I, I misunderstood. So the question is actually, will government be replaced by algorithms? I can't answer that, at least not in, not in the next short time. But I am certainly very concerned about government's control and the examples that we're seeing happening out of Zhengzhen in China. That, that is horrific to me. And the fact that governments uh, do have the ability to use technology to control humans in the point that they are now doing that, again, without increasing their manpower or their person power, they can go ahead and start controlling human behavior. And they don't even have to do anything um, violent. Just the knowledge that you are being watched will change the way you behave, uh, and that's scary. So I'm not, I can't answer the question about when will government become algorithmic, uh, but I can say some of the early signs of what we're seeing is, is scary for sure. 
and goes back to the obligations that I have on the screen. But when do we start to ask the question of when is it appropriate to use technology? Other questions? Yes. An aversion? Yeah, I, I, so the comment is, if utilities can start to track um, our behavior just by monitoring our electrical, uh, electrical usage, uh, does that start to limit our freedom? I, I think whether it does in a small case or not, absolutely. I think you should be concerned. I think this is, you know, this is obviously, there's the extreme reaction, which you go off grid. Right? And then there's most of us reaction, which is, I couldn't be bothered. Um, uh, and then is the reaction to sort of say, what, what point can I start providing my own solar power? And you know, I think, again, in Europe, you guys are leading this. Certainly in terms of green, you are. I, I stayed in a house a couple days ago in Budapest where his, he is monitoring his electrical usage to know how much did he actually, how much did it cost him per day? And was he actually able to generate more than he consumed? Because by doing that, he's hiding to the utility anything that's going on about his own consumption because it's being produced automatically. Um, should we be concerned? Obviously, China is a clear indication that we should. Uh, I just don't know how much it starts to impact us. The one other comment I'll make about this goes back to my point about the data discussion you have with your children. It turns out that the millennials and newer generations are far less concerned about the data they're producing than those of us on a later, an older generation. So those of us in an older generation, uh, I'm going on 25 in case you can't tell, those of us in an older generation are, are far more concerned about what data we're producing than the younger generation who've always had phones. They can't imagine a world without phones, and the phones always came with the ability to generate data and provide data to companies that it's no longer affecting them. And so the fact that you're asking this question indicates you're obviously over 25. Other questions? Is this working? Yeah. Okay. No. <laughs> so uh, the question is, if you have some research about uh, the people who will lose the work because of these new technologies coming, and they are maybe not capable of finding a new job, so what these people might do? What yeah. is the future for them? Yeah. So going back to the labor issue about um, jobs being eliminated, First of all, I want to go back and look at historically. There were forecasts about jobs going away with the me mechanization. And it turned out the only, th the only thing that lost its job were horses uh, in the past. It wasn't humans. It turns out that the me me mechanization uh, actually improved and increased labor. Uh, I think that, uh, I suspect, I don't want to make a forecast, but I suspect that this is going to be different. Uh, and this is why consideration for things like UBI, universal basic income, are being considered by, 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 um, by governments. I, I'll point out one thing that, that I think is interesting about this. Amazon, which is the scary juggernaut uh, that makes it extremely challenging to sort of think of your own ideas. And the amount of Amazon, you might think, is all about what they're selling. Uh, and what's actually much more interesting, uh, an interesting thing about what Amazon's doing uh, is actually in terms of what they're learning about uh, human behavior and what they're buying. And, and, and those, that's a much more, they're taking the data that you as humans are producing and your reviews and, and the things that you're buying, that's a much more valuable asset to them. It turns out that many of us today might be willing to go to a different website to buy something, but we might go back to Amazon because we want to see what Amazon's reviews are of that particular item because that's the knowledge. Uh, so back to your question. Um, Bezos, the, the CEO of, of Amazon, is, is very believes fairly strongly that, in fact, UBI, universal basic income, would be a good thing for society. Now, you might ask, well, why does he hold this opinion that that's the case? Because he knows what's going on in, your fac in, the, in the distribution centers. He knows what's going on in the factories. He knows that, in fact, the, the distribution center that just went up about uh, 30 miles, uh, 46 kilometers from my house is entirely automated. It's entirely controlled by, by robots. 
And so he believes that the people that he's putting out of work are going to need some basic income in order to prevent the revolt, the very revolt that we've seen in past industrial revolutions. <laughs> and where else would the money go that they're going to get from university basic income, income than to go ahead and buy the things on Amazon? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. I'll repeat your question if you just want to yell it out. Thank you. Am I heard? Yeah. Uh, let's return to the dating apps. You talked about... Uh, I'm not afraid that uh, the result of the algorithm uh, can control the people. For example, uh, right now they are saying that what color is preferred for the other person, but then it changes uh, this output and uh, you're starting to wear uh, the color that the uh, algorithm provides to you. And the same thing for everything else. Uh, so let me try to repeat that question. The, the question was similar to what was asked earlier, which was, when we start getting controlled by algorithms, do the algorithms then start changing our behavior such that yeah. it starts to change human behavior in general? Yes. Uh, yeah, and, and I think the best examples to look for this is actually in the financial industry. It turns out most of financial buying that occurs today in the stock market is all done by computers. There's very little human. Uh, the, the only time that humans are actually making transactions on stock markets these days are you as individuals. But corporations and organizations and financial firms are all doing that algorithmically. Uh, and, and that should really cause you to question sort of can you do better than them? Um, and now what, and the most interesting example of this is actually the example of, of, of Go. And when, when Google produced a computer that could beat the Go champion, Go is a game like chess, in case you guys aren't aware. Uh, and the first Go uh, algorithm came out. Uh, and this was true with chess as well, they, they trained it by feeding it tons of data about different games and, getting, and using um, AI and machine learning to sort of forecast what the next move, best move would be. And then for the second generation, they put computers against computers. And that's how they beat the Go champion in the world. It's because they now had a computer that first learned by looking at every single human's game and then played that computer against another computer. And the response by the Go champion at the time was, it did and moved in ways that I'd never, ever, ever seen or had any concept was possible in the game of Go. So are we being changed and transformed and as a behavior different? Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you joining me. Thank you.